Prosecutor in the Teresa Halbach murder case has written a book about the crime called Avery. Ken Kratz says that his book focuses on the case against Stephen Avery and the facts the Netflix documentary Making a Murderer left out. Ken Kratz has a book signing in Madison this weekend and he joins us here on Live at Four right now. Okay. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate Here's it. Here's the book. So I'm going to say it's safe to assume that you saw the docuseries? I did. I saw all ten parts uh, back in December of uh, 15, you know, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't a documentary. This is an advocacy piece. It's, it's really made by and for the defense. And, and as I watched it, uh, my very first opinion was, um, this is distorting. This is really a misrepresentation of what the jury saw. It's a very, very well done docuseries, but it's not what the jury saw. So to suggest to millions uh, of people around the world uh, that uh, Stephen Avery was the victim of some kind of uh, tampering or some kind of uh, shenanigans going on in, in Manitowoc really isn't, isn't fair at all. So I wrote the book uh, to really set the record straight if I could. What do you think their motive was? Well, you know, these are, were at the time two film students from Columbia University in, in New York, uh, very, um, you know, very liberal, but, but certainly they have the right to have an opinion and, and have a point of view. And uh, it seemed, though, to be more crusading, if that makes sense to you. It wasn't really about the case. It was more about criminal justice reform, which, again, I, I, uh, I support and I, I commend very much. Uh, but let's not pretend that the information then that you provided in your docu-series uh, was anything close to what actually happened in the trial. They say that you were asked to be involved in it, but you said, have said that you were not asked. Well, in 2013, they did ask me. Uh, this was uh, after they had sold it to, uh, to Netflix, as I understand. A couple of years before it came out, they wanted to try to get the other side. If they could, I asked to see their first movie uh, that they had made. Uh, by the way, Making a Murderer is the second movie that they created, 2008. Uh, they had their first movie, which was presented at the Columbia Film Festival, and I wanted to see that final version. The defense got to see it. I thought I was entitled to see what their agenda was, and, and they declined. I think I was spot on there with what this was going to turn into. You know, these filmmakers, very, very talented, but they showed exactly what they wanted people to see and and that's uh, that's okay uh, except when uh, you're making these representations that this was how things happened uh, through different editing techniques things like splicing or things like cutting or or things that you're familiar with some other uh, producers and things getting into trouble with uh, they employed all of those techniques and really created a narrative rather than presenting what what actually happened well they're very very convincing because millions of people think he's not guilty. They do. And and they should. If I watched just making murder and if I thought that's what happened, uh, it really gives a distorted view. You know, the the, the book, uh, what I what I try to do is to go through uh, piece by piece not only the evidence that we had that convicted Stephen Avery, but all of the ways that these filmmakers misrepresented what happened, all these different kind of of uh, of techniques that they used and at the end of the day, uh, there are very real people that were influenced and impacted by what they did. There were two really good police officers, officers Lincoln Colburn, for anybody that watched uh, the series, really were made out to be um, uh, very sketchy, very uh, uh, very uh, uh, wronging uh, type of, of individuals, but these turned out to be two of the very best officers, and unfortunately, uh, they've now had to retire in shame. They've now had all of these very real consequences, and I think, uh, quite frankly, they, did, they deserve an apology. We are back with Ken Kratz talking about his new book about the Stephen Avery case and what making a murderer got wrong. So what did the documentary get wrong? Well, when we talk about, uh, let's talk about splicing. It is the mother of all improper editing techniques. When you take an answer, let's say from a, a trial um, examination, and you, you harvest an answer that was given, and you actually put it as an answer to another question. You know, uh, you or most legitimate uh, uh, producers or, or TV or, or movie makers would get fired doing that kind of thing. You just can't splice answers uh, into there. These filmmakers were not only not chastised, 
they were given an Emmy. They got the Emmy for creative editing, and it's that kind of misrepresentation that I really took uh, such offense about was really one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book. You say they left evidence out of the, out of the piece? They did. They left uh, many things out. Let's say um, uh, Teresa Halbach's uh, electronics, her camera, and her PDA um, and her telephone are burned by Avery in his own burn barrel, just about 20 feet from, uh, from uh, his, his door. Uh, they don't have an answer for that. They don't have an answer for why uh, her electronics are being burned by uh, the defendant, Stephen Avery. So what do they do? They let it out. They don't even include it in, in the docuseries. That and, and uh, DNA on the hood latch and, and other things about the bullet matching the, the gun hanging over the, uh, the bed. You know, those are just two important pieces of, of, of evidence to leave out of really such a, a, a compelling piece as what it was. I imagine it would be interesting to be a fly on your wall when you were first watching the series. Well, I'm not so sure it was uh, it was interesting. It was a it was a little more uh, animated than I wanted it to be. You know, when you live through something and you know what the jury got to see and when none of that or virtually none of that compelling strong evidence was shown in a 10-part series, you get disappointed. You know, it, we aren't just talking about entertainment. Documentaries, as far as I'm concerned, were meant to inform, not just to entertain. And, and really, they took the road where it is all entertainment, almost nothing uh, informative, or at least to give the viewer an opportunity to make a decision whether he might be guilty or not guilty. And lost in all this was a young woman lost her life. She, she did, you know. Teresa Hobach is the one and only victim in this case. I stood up for Teresa during the trial and then decided 10 years later to stand up for her, for her family, and for the process, for the, the process that worked, I think, exactly the way it was supposed to. I can't imagine the family having to go through this over and over and over again or to be asked questions about the real murderer out there or even the brother being suggested as, as one of the murders. That's not fair. That's not the kind of thing that filmmakers should reopen, at least without any evidence. There's not even a, a spot of evidence that suggests that there was any kind of shenanigans going on in how has your life been since all of this? I mean, you were, you're tied well, to this. Well, it's, it's changed dramatically, you know, and in January of 2016, I was voted the most hated man on the internet. I don't know how they come up with these, uh, <laughs> with, polls. With these things, <laughs> right, but, but uh, it, it still brought me out of anonymity uh, to a place that wasn't, uh, wasn't all that popular, but uh, I decided still to stand up and to take the heat uh, for that because I felt so strongly, uh, not only about what a good job these uh, Wisconsin law enforcement officers did, but felt so strongly that the real truth uh, had to come out as, as the story, and that's uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book. Are you still practicing law? I gave it up in uh, December of uh, this last year, uh, quit the active uh, practice uh, of law, but I had been a defense attorney for those years up until uh, December 31st. And how's the book tour been going? It's exhausting. You can hear my voice is, <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is going. Uh, you know, I've been in New York and, and L.A. We just, uh, uh, Jerry Buting and myself just finished shooting a show out in, uh, out in L.A. together, which is uh, going to be quite, uh, quite entertaining. Um, it's a lot. And it's something I didn't expect there to be uh, so much of. You know, at least I get to come home Saturday to, uh, to Madison. And uh, hopefully some folks will come out and, and uh, have conversations with me. And uh, hopefully the Badgers won't play at uh, <laughs> between 3 and 5 p.m. Uh, uh, at the Barnes & Noble on, on the west side of town, I guess. So uh, if they can push that off or if I can mm. have anything to say about it for the NCAA, maybe they can push it off past the book signing. Yeah, I think a lot of people want to come out and uh, yeah. talk with you a little bit. Yeah, I hope so. Let's uh, just reiterate the book signing is Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Barnes & Noble at West Town Mall. All right. Ken, Ken Kratz, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks very much today. for having me. Appreciate it.